Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Crawford here. I have some books on capitalism and uh, on succeeding and on the men who succeed in capitalism. I have uh, five of them here. Um, three of them I've read more recently, two of them a little longer ago. The Age of Muggles by Stuart H. Holbrook. Um, I, this isn't the copy I read, my copy's in Utah. But this is about the 1800s and the robber barons and great tycoons. Holbrook is a pretty good author. Um, he doesn't go too philosophical. You know, these authors who don't know anything at all, they're just doing history, and then once in a while they try a philosophical explanation, and it's just embarrassing. He just stays out of it. He doesn't go philosophical. Once in a while he does and embarrasses himself a little. But anyways, he's a pretty good author. This was published in 1953. Uh, this has chapters on Rockefeller, uh, Carnegie, uh, Standard Oil itself, Henry Ford, Mellon, the False Midas, the DuPonts, the Guggenheims. So that contains a lot of valuable items. Now I'm going to introduce all five of these, the other four here, and then I'm going to tell you what I learned across all of them. What I, what I, I mean, each individual story in life has its own lessons. But once you look at all these success stories across 200 plus years of American history, then uh, you get a grasp on what success means in a free economy. The Enterprising Americans, a business history of the United States. The title is perhaps. Uh, better than uh, the book itself, but it's close. It's a pretty good book. This was published in 61, 62. Uh, I started and finished this within a month, which is rare. I don't usually make it all the way through a book. I usually stop at least halfway through um, and come back to it later if I ever come back. But this I actually made it through in less than a month. This is by John uh, Cam... John Chamberlain. The Great Merchants by Mahoney, specifically about the men who ran retail outlets, by Tom Mahoney, published in the 50s, right? 47, published in 1947. That's pretty good. And it's about uh, the, uh, the Hudson's Bay Company, Brooks Brothers, Tiffany's, Singer Sewing Machines, uh, Marshall Field and Company, Brentano's Booksellers to the World, quite a few others. This one I didn't read. I listened to it on CD, but I have a copy of it here, so I'll show it to you. Sam Walton, Made in America. Uh, uh, he dictated this to uh, someone. He didn't write it. Uh, everything was taken care of for him. Uh, but he was an old guy at the time, and he, his business was retail. Give him a break. Donald Trump, The Art of the Deal. This is about making his way in the American real estate market. So it's not about, the, it's not about retail. It's not about industry. Um, so it's another dimension. Now, what did I learn from all five of these books? The salient fact I saw, and I try to take this lesson away for myself because I'm trying to open a school which is not um, like a religious institution or something. It's, it's not a charitable institution. It's going to be for profit and I hope to make a fair amount of money before I die. I hope to be comfortably well off. Um, what I took from all these for my lesson, each, as I said, individual has different lessons but every single one of them had one thing in common. They all took their project to be the most important thing in the universe, the center of the universe, without any competition from other considerations. Like uh, for Sam Walton, lowering the price of uh, ribbons and strings and summer sandals from 20 cents to 18 cents, or from 20 to 15, or something like that. That was just, that made his day. 
Um, or the guy who, let's see, what's, or how about uh, Trump? Just getting this corner of this block in Manhattan, this area he thought was kind of a nice neighborhood, and then building a skyscraper on it, which took years to put together, three, four, five years before the thing came to fruition. And he, he, he's not worried about the invasion of Iraq, or maybe he is a little bit, or he's not worried about national health care, maybe he is, but his daily passionate drive is to get some building somewhere, sell this other building that he bought and refurbished, or whatever, as if that's the center of the world. Now, this was particularly striking in The Great Merchants by Mahoney, because there were a couple of really large merchants who were making their way during the time of the Civil War. And they just continued on as if the Civil War wasn't happening, as, you know, 20 or 30 or 50 percent of Americans did, or 70 percent or something. A lot of people did, and, he, and these were some of them. So they're great men in the things they do. They aren't necessarily great philosophers, sages of the ages. But then philosophers generally don't start multi-million dollar empires that make a living for thousands and thousands of people over generations. So everybody does their part. They took their project to be of prime importance, and they didn't let anything distract them. Even family vacations for Sam Walton. Family vacations was a time, were a time to go and look at other retail stores in other regions, and they spent a lot of their time going through Kmart's and stuff in places they hadn't been before. So there was that similarity between all of them, but there were big differences that you might not expect. And I want to do make I do want to make a bit of a point about this. There were. Um, personalities from one end of the spectrum to another on things like, for example, uh, Rockefeller, who was borrowing money to people when he was like 15 years old. He started lending money out. When he was 20 years old, he was lending out tens of thousands of dollars. This is in the 1800s. Uh, on the other hand, um, Henry Ford and Sam Walton both were in debt up to their eyeballs, in Sam Walton's case, right up to when they uh, went public and, and uh, went on the stock market and floated the company on the stock market. Right till that time, they were so, they were just to, up to their eyeballs in debt. And his wife said, in a, uh, I think it's quoted in the book I read, his wife said, we were just constantly borrowing another huge line of credit to open this another store or two more stores or whatever, constantly up to our eyeballs. And as soon as we got any money, we borrowed a bunch of money to go with it and started a new store. And that's where Walmart came from. So at the one hand, you have industrial giants that made themselves by always having money and lending it out to people and pinching their pennies. And you have industrial giants who never had any money of their own and had to find somebody with money to make their thing succeed. Also, you can't uh, generalize on their family history. Some of them come from very nice family homes like Henry Ford uh, had a, an okay family home, but his parents fought a lot and he didn't care for that. But there wasn't like abuse and violence and uh, there was no divorce, there was no dire poverty, they were always able to afford everything they needed. So he came from an okay home where his parents, he remembers them fighting. Compared to, um, I think it's Carnegie or um, one of the industrialists in the 1800s came from Ireland. And one of his parents was dead, I believe. But at any rate, he had to start working to earn his daily bread, like at the age of 12 or something, very early. And he became an industrial giant. So a pampered home where they have everything and the worst memory he has is his parents yelled at each other, uh, and completely poverty-stricken immigrants that have to rise up out of tenement houses. Invariably, though, I should have to add this to the other, that every single one of these great men took their 